Welcome to another episode of Adorium Conversations. I'm Dominic McVeigh. I'm a special advisor to Adorium, but I'm also a business leader, a philanthropist, an entrepreneur, an advisor to governments, think tanks, charities, and I'm someone that gets his own boots on the ground and builds businesses in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, Kenya, Ethiopia, Sri Lanka, Mexico, creating thousands of sustainable jobs in the most ethical environments possible. And it is my pleasure to be in conversation today with Mike Penrose. I met Mike um, when he was CEO at UNICEF and giving a talk on some of the amazing work that he was doing at UNICEF at the time. And I'd love Mike for you to start off by just introducing yourself to, to the audience and uh, sharing a bit more about your background before we get into some juicy conversation on the wider impact of coronavirus and, and the work that you, you are doing to make a difference. Thank you, Dominic. Um, so Mike Penrose, I've been about 27 years in the aid and development sector, um, look, working for governments. I've worked with it uh, for commercial organisations, for the United Nations and for not-for-profits. I was the global humanitarian director for Save the Children, uh, the first foreign CEO of a big French international not-for-profit called Action Contre la Fin. Um, I was the CEO of UNICEF, as you said, and I spent about 15 to 20 years doing direct operations of humanitarian operations on the, on the ground. Um, but most recently I've set up an organization called the Sustainability Group uh, uh, with an idea to try and bridge that gap between business's desire and, and real um, commercial interest now in building sustainable brands with social purpose and the actual ability to deliver on the ground and the sort of thing you're doing, uh, Dominic, at the moment of turning that into something that's both commercially and socially viable. Um, and I've given several speeches or, or, or attended several Adorium events. Tell us, Mike, I mean, talking on that theme of uh, businesses doing good and sustainability, what, what can and what should organisations be doing? And I've really noticed the, the more compassionate and ethical organisations are responding better, are performing better during the coronavirus uh, pandemic. But what else can those that are just learning about doing good or just realising that they actually need to do good, what, what, what should they be doing? I think, you know, as you, with any organisation, if you look at your stakeholders, the, the entire sort of network of people that you work with, and then at your core capability, um, there are a, a thousand different things that organisations can do. We've seen the very high profile ones like hotels converting themselves into residences for um, NHS or for, for health workers, for anybody in the garment industry, and you know this very well Dominic, looking to make PPE or, or manufacture materials um, that, that can be used in the treatment of coronavirus. But then on top of that, organisations have a huge and diverse range of, of stakeholders in the way they access, and it can be anything from, they could do anything from public information through to the identification of, of vulnerable people um, amongst their consumer base or just sometimes adding a little bit onto the products they sell and making sure it goes to to causes that they can associate with and that actually actually have purpose but I think some of the, the organizations that have the greatest potential are the big manufacturing and especially FMCG groups working in the developing world because they, they these are places where they manufacture and they also have some of their biggest consumer bases and i think that there's something very much about making accessible to people that the basic necessities during difficult times of hardship that would both embed their brand in the minds of their future consumers and also ensure that a, a great example at the moment is unilever where they are looking at all of the hygiene and soap and materials that they produce and how they can deploy them into the communities where they both source and where they sell. And I think that's a very good example of saying, what's our core product? Where do we work and where do we sell? What can we do to actually make a difference? It doesn't have to be charity. It can be commercial, but it needs to be socially minded. So talking about hygiene in difficult places, you've worked a lot in refugee camps. Yeah. What will be happening in terms of hygiene implementation, the lack of access to water, um, the companies that hopefully are supporting the on the ground work that's happening in refugee camps. But what will be the major challenges faced in some of these um, uh, facilities? Well, uh, hygiene is the single biggest issue, I think, facing um, the health of, of refugees and displaced people everywhere. Now, as, as we've spoken, Dominic, it looked 
there's a, a high possibility I'll be deploying very soon to lead a health mission into the biggest refugee camp in the world and on the Bangladesh uh, Myanmar border with the Rohingya refugees and an awful lot of the focus on that will be to bolster water sanitation and hygiene because already in some of the shocking statistics already the biggest cause of death of children especially children under five is pneumonia Pneumonia and undernutrition are the two biggest killers of, of young children. But the, the, the main cause of pneumonia is not viral, and the main cause of undernutrition is not an absence of food. It's acute watery diarrhea and it's respiratory tract infections, and both of those are caused by poor hygiene. And when people are living in unsanitary conditions, their immune systems are weakened. Uh, the, the children tend to be more vulnerable to respiratory infection anyway. So what we're very concerned about is that COVID will go through these camps and pick up on people that are already have a slightly weakened immune system or are already slightly more susceptible to pneumonia or, or, or respiratory infections. And that's where we're going to see really high levels of, of, of morbidity or illness and mortality. Um, so what we really need to do is get out there both information on how to maintain hygiene in what are effectively quite unsanitary conditions. If you look at the Myanmar, um, the Rohingya refugee camps in Bangladesh, this is a million people living cheek by jowl in temporary shelters. Um, it, it is about how you space out the type of sanitation you need for, for the lavatory, how you have an effective number of water points, how you train people on how to wash their hands properly, and how you train them on how to keep clean in these environments, because that will have the single biggest impact in terms of reducing the impact, uh, reducing the, the effect of COVID-19 in these areas. It's already something we struggle with. It's the biggest killer of children already. And this is the, the big worry we have. I mean, water, as we know, there's often, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, it, it, it is it is in uh, extremely inaccessible to many and can often be controlled by cartels. And we're asking people to wash their hands in refugee camps, in, in townships, in very hostile remote conditions. And it's, it's, it's not going to work. We know it's not going to work. And how are we going to protect, continue to protect those on the front line and people, day traders, hawkers, those that what they sell on the day is how they pay for their food on the night. How do we tell them you can't go out unless you wash your hands? And they turn around and say, well, I haven't washed my hands for the last 20 years. And the, when I do get water, it goes down my mouth. Uh, yeah. my you know it's it's the, the the needs are so different water is 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 not there as necessarily a luxury or you know to have to bathe in it, it's it's to drink and it's to survive with um and now we're asking people to give up precious commodities which they so desperately need uh, and get them to understand that washing hands is going to protect you and social distances is going to protect you and that you've got 16 people to a house and maybe livestock living within the confines of, of the, the, the hut or the shed that might have been built um, to, for the family. It, it's, it's really difficult to comprehend how we can break the cycle of the spread of the pandemic yeah. in the poorest parts of the world. Um, I, I think you're spot on and I think what you have alluded to there at the very beginning has to be the approach we take. There will need to be a short term, for want of a better word, humanitarian surge. We'll need to, to, to restart the type of things we do at the very beginning of an emergency such as water trucking, such as the provision of bladder tanks, and, and, and making sure that as much of this, because in somewhere like Bangladesh, water is not a scarce, scarce commodity, but clean water is. So making sure that there is yeah. a good balance between the type of, of, of water you need just to wash your hands and the type you need to drink. But that's only a sticking plaster. That isn't going to fix a problem that's going to be with us in a, for a very long time. And what we need to do is stabilize the situation. As you've said, the, the idea of social distancing and staying at home for three months in a, in a place where if you don't work in the morning, as you, you said, you don't eat in the evening, uh, and where people are living cheek by jowl in very, very cramped and unsanitary conditions is just, it's impossible. I think we have to assume that the majority of people are gonna get COVID considering how contagious it is. What we need is that short-term um, 
input to make sure that the effects are as minimal as they can be, which are improved by sanitation, which are improved by good public health and access to public health services. And then simultaneous, not after, it's not linear, we need to start looking at the economics of this. We need to start looking about how people can re-establish their livelihoods, how people can start earning money, how they can get their nutritional status up. And that's not through handouts, it's through, as you said, it's through small jobs. That already 85, 88% of Africa are casual laborers. Outside of refugee camps, it's casual laborers. These are not people who will stand down because we're telling them to stay at home. They will have to go out, they will have to work, they will have to pick, grow, trade, and we need to get the capital back in the system to allow them to do that, or we're going to see the secondary effects of COVID. And what terrifies me, and, and the World Food Programme's just come out with this, is that if people are not allowed to pick up and trade again, what we're going to see already, last year, 135 million people were acutely food insecure. That is, they are food insecure to the point that they risk starvation. Off the back of COVID, for the first time in a very long time, we're going to see the number of people uh, acutely food insecure going up. And they're estimating it could go up to as much as 265 million. And that will all be in countries that are already chronically food insecure, that already have conflict, and when the majority of the economy is based around casual labour. South Sudan, Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, a lot of the Central African states, the Yemen, uh, Afghanistan, countries like this. Um, so unless we actually start re-engaging with business and allowing people the opportunity to, to trade and to earn money as quickly as possible, the secondary effects of COVID are likely to be far worse than the primary effects. So this brings me on to a topic I want to talk about in trade, trade in particular, and safe trade, and creating safe trade zones. And for people um, that are listening in on this Adorim conversation right now, and thinking we've got bigger problems at home, why should we be worrying about what's happening in the developing world? Well, first of all, I question your morals, uh, ladies and gentlemen. But secondly, if uh, men and women cannot farm, uh, if men and women cannot mine in sub-Saharan Africa, if men and women uh, cannot feed themselves in sub-Saharan Africa, you won't be buying mobile phones next year because the minerals and rare earths that are in your mobile phones are coming from places like the Congo and Angola and South Sudan where the oil is getting pumped. And if people are dying because they can't get food and borders are closed because goods can't uh, get med and, and there's 20 mile tailbacks and medicine can't cross to save people's lives, who is going to provide factories with the uh, minerals and the rare earths that you so require for your phone. Where are you going to get your avocados from in the winters? Where are your roses going to come from on Valentine's Day? You know, this is a global con economy. We are globally connected. We are all people sharing one planet. And the failure of Africa or, and those in other developing countries in Bangladesh and Southeast Asia will be a failure for all of us. And we will not overcome coronavirus until every link in the chain is solid and unique and to do that we have to support the trade initiative so i've been working on programs with organizations like the halo trust trademark east africa un ops a sister agency of one of the organizations you worked for in very much trying to understand how do we keep trade moving so for example in southern africa there's a 90 mile tail back at the moment where they're stopping truck drivers crossing borders. Um, on, in addition to that, there's the, the, the rumor mill has started and everyone's told they're gonna to be getting injected if they cross the border with a vaccine that no one knows about and that the West is gonna test it on the Africans first. So the truck drivers are either queuing for five or six days or they're getting in their trucks and driving home. Um, so what is in those trucks as you've spoken about, Mike, it's food, it's medicine. These are not glamorous items like handbags and, and, uh, and watches and a nice pair of uh, Nike trainers. Most goods that are moving around Africa, Bangladesh, if it's not for export to clove you or to get your electric car moving or even your push bicycle, it is food and medicine to keep people in Africa alive. Yeah. Um, so safe trade is key. Governments in the donor agencies need to start funding this and we've got to keep goods moving. We've got to keep people alive because that food insecurity from those statistics you just quoted from the WFP are, are horrifying. 
you know, it's, 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 it's a tenfold um, decrease in, in what we're experiencing on a good day. So we're going from what, 150 million to, to potentially half the continent um, in, in food security of Africa. Yeah. That, that, yeah. that has major impacts for everyone in the world. And this is yeah. not just a blue peter appeal on Ethiopia. This is, this crosses borders beyond anyone's imagination. Yes. What, what, are you, what, what are you seeing is happening or what is not happening that needs to happen? And, and what do we hear in, in the developed world? Those, and when I talk about the developed world, if you're able to watch this on a laptop or an iPhone, you've got a lot more than the rest. So um, don't think if you're stuck, dialed in on this Adorium conversation from somewhere that's not as, as uh, rich as the UK or the US, you, you have a privilege that a lot of people do not. So what, what, what do we need to be thinking about? I think that there are three particular things. The first, and very, very quickly, if you talk to WHO, um, we need to bolster the public health systems in all of these countries that are seeing this impact, because only with good, effective public health systems, and that's sentinel sites, which are called, uh, not just in the capital, but out in the rural areas, will we start allow, giving the confidence to open the borders and allow the, the trade and, and, and the aid and everything to flow. But until enough is there to make sure that people both have the confidence and the access to to basic public health not just for coronavirus but for everything else that's going on uh, at the same time because all the other diseases illnesses and, and, and public health concerns have not stopped because of coronavirus so the first is really a renewed investment in public health and, and pretty damn quick because that's what they're going to need it was 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 sort of with utter dismay that we saw that the US had cut their funding to WHO when the rest of the world should be ramping it up because it, it, it's only through public health that, that, that we're actually going to tackle, tackle this effectively. I think the second is also to heed the warning from th that we were seeing last year and the year before. When you have economic decline, you tend to get conflict. And when you have a, a mixture of economic decline and conflict, you get migration. And we, we've, for the last few years, we've seen large outflows of people from Syria and from, from the Middle East coming to Europe. And we've been categorizing that as a disaster or, or, or this, you know, arguably is what's led to things like Brexit and some of the rise of nationalism. In Africa, you have the fastest growing population on the planet. By 2100, Gates is estimating that it will have a larger population than Asia. Um, already a, a lot of the chronically food insecure areas like West Africa, like Southern Africa and certain areas of East Africa, um, they're coming under increased uh, economic pressure because of COVID-19 and other reasons. They've, the World Bank's just estimated that their, their good scenario for Africa pre-COVID was 3.9% economic growth. They've revised that down shortly afterwards to 0.4 and now they're talking at a 5.1% drop. In, in economic growth. So a contraction of 5.1% in Africa if COVID hits very bad. If young people, young men don't have a job, they tend to either pick up a weapon or they tend to move. And we will see a massive migration, a massive movement of people from the African continent. And where they're gonna go? North of Africa is, is the richest area on the planet. They're gonna to go towards Europe. And that's a, a stark warning, I think, that don't expect Africa to sit there and suffer in silence with this one. Unless we tackle the economics of this, we will for a very long time see the type of migration that we've been seeing out of Syria, especially in some of the areas worst affected by food insecurity. So by bolstering uh, some of the, the, the infrastructure for exportation, the infrastructure for manufacturing and production, by allowing agriculture, because one of the biggest concerns, and we've talked about this before, Dominic, is that without the immediate availability of capital, um, Farmers will not be able to buy the seeds or the fertilizer they need to plant in the right seasons, which means not only will there be food insecurity now uh, because of a lack of, uh, of cross-border trade, that will go on into next year, and next year's harvest will not have enough to balance between seed and consumption, so it'll knock on to the next. And so this will be something that will probably outlive the, the, the COVID virus unless we tackle it now. So you need that short-term investment in public health, and you need that short, medium, and long-term investment in appropriate uh, economics in Africa, which will be bolstering the agricultural sector, bolstering the logistics to allow it to trade effectively and freely and providing it with the type of liquidity it will need to recover from this because without that liquidity um, it, the whole thing is going to seize up going back to what you quite rightly said before people who if they don't work in the morning can't eat in the evening need liquidity
and yeah. we've seen trade volumes of imported goods into East Africa, which covers Djibouti, Berbera in Somaliland, um, Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, Mombasa in Kenya. I think it's dropped 90% to mm -hmm. ships calling to port. In the second week of March, typically Mombasa would receive 14 ships. I think it received two and that continues to decline. It can't decline much further until there's none. Um, so we're not getting the seed in, we're not getting the fertilizer in, we're not getting the medicines in. And these ports are supplying into 12, 13 landlocked countries that we have in uh, Africa. And so we're failing on medicines, we're failing on the medical support, we're failing on getting goods in, we're failing on getting people to move, uh, we're failing on allowing people to trade, to, to raise money to bring food to their plate for the evening. When is the world's media going to start to recognize that there is a crisis that isn't going to stop after a virus or antiviral um, or inoculation for COVID-19 comes? Yeah. You know, we're talking about this uh, pandemic lasting until 2021 in, in the developed world. This might, might have a 10, 20 year knock on effect in the undeveloped world. I think we're talking about the potential for wiping out the majority of gains that we've seen so far in a number of areas from both the MDGs and the SDGs. We're going to take a big step backwards unless we deal with it. I think, uh, if I'm honest and cynical, I think the, 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 the international media will take note when it starts to impact on us. Uh, and it will, if, if we don't pay attention. I think that there is a great opportunity, actually, to paint a very positive narrative as well about some of the gains that we have achieved and some of the opportunities that exist. These are countries that are still net importers and you quite rightly say when the ports go down and the ships don't land, anything that is tech, biotech, medicine, the majority of these things uh, as importation will dry up. But actually what we've seen, especially in, in uh, East Africa, is some of the biggest developments to compensate for things like an absence of logistics infrastructure and an absence of banking systems. Uh, in, in East Africa, the, the, the prevalence of things like mobile phone banking and technological solutions to development problems is far greater in East Africa than it is even in the UK in places like this investment into it because it needs to be. And I think there is a huge opportunity to invest. I think there's a huge opportunity for people to look beyond, you know, your startup in Shoreditch or your, your, your New York opportunity and start looking further afield to, as I said, the, the fastest growing con continent on earth, a continent with a very, very young demographic. So the, the consumers that you get now are going to be brand loyal for a very, very long time. And one that... There is an upside as well as a downside. We can look at it as in incredibly negative the whole time. And, and, and if we don't get it right, you're quite right, it's going to be awful uh, in a lot of these countries. But if we do, I think that there's a possibility to shift the entire commercial narrative away from a sort of Milton Friedman shareholder basis towards a much broader stakeholder basis of economics. And Africa's right for that. Young people, increasing middle class in the cities, great opportunity to invest in tech, uh, a great opportunity to invest in the type of innovation that will compensate for everything you're talking about there, which is a dependence on, on imports uh, and aid. So I think a lot of it will be about shifting the narrative a little bit, but until we either see an economic benefit or it starts to impact on us negatively, traditionally what tends to happen is we tend to ignore it until it's too late, which is why Zimbabwe is in the state it is in, which is why Uganda at the moment is in the state that it's in, and why countries like the Democratic Republic of the Congo can go through what was called Africa's World War and nobody really noticed. So I, I hope that through a positive narrative we can start to change things as well as just waiting until it impacts on us. And it will because a 5.1% drop in the economy of Africa will have a knock-on effect globally. It's, um, you got me thinking there, Mike, about when the, we saw these horrendous forest fires raging in Brazil. And yep. at the same time, there was four times the size of a fire burning in the DRC mm -hmm. and not talked about, not talked about at all, um, and continues to burn and continues to be a far greater fire and forest deforestation and devastation in Africa than 
Brazil and the politics at play in that, which I really think came down to President Macron not wanting to do a free trade agreement with Brazil because it affected all the beef farmers in France, knowing that lots of cheap Brazilian beef would turn up. Um, so how, how do we get these issues on the tables without it always having to be a political game? And that's where businesses need to get their boots on the ground. Young entrepreneurs need to understand the issues. But as you said, the opportunities. Let's not just think about a delivery app for a shortage. Let's think about how do you engage with the young entrepreneurs and the organizations which are doing so much good and active work in the developed world and give you access to a far greater market and potential, not necessarily in GDP yeah. terms, but access to people and, and, and making a positive change. That's where I hope businesses start to pivot. And as we are now doing all of our business via a laptop and a screen and not leaving our houses, why, what, what stops you from doing a Zoom call 2,000 miles away? It's no different from doing a Zoom call two miles away. Yeah. Uh, which we're probably doing right now. Of course, there's those challenges of access to internet and stable lines and power, but there's means and ways. And I know in the refugee camps that I visited and of course the ones you've worked in, there are ways to access the communities there to engage. And that, that needs to be something people think about. Right, I'm locked in my bedroom. Now I might need to start thinking about the world because I can't trade with my neighbor any differently than the way I can trade with a neighbor 2,000 miles away. Absolutely. Getting people to think about those solutions. And we are, as you say, hopefully, as things get better with COVID here in the UK, we'll get some attention on the developed world, on the underdeveloped world, and some of the pressing issues that we see with food insecurity and uh, lack of access to medical supplies. I just hope there's not a big scramble today where everyone's trying to bolster their hospital and medical responses and forgetting about the longer term response, which is going to have the bigger impact on lives. More people, as we know, will die in Africa from the effects, the indirect effects of COVID as opposed to the direct effects of catching COVID and what that means. I think that this is also, you're, you're quite right, this is where traditionally the way we have looked at aid and trade and humanitarian assistance has fallen down. And, and actually a lot of the premise behind why I, I left the aid sector to start the business I did was based on exactly that. It's that aid is still very much delivered as a sticking plaster and development aid is still looked at very much from a, um, a sort of governmental normative um, uh, uh, approach so you bolster governments and, and the, the ultimately then you'll create a, a, a conducive environment to good trade which unfortunately is nonsense uh, in a lot of environments the idea that the central african republic or a lot of these countries ever had a strong central government that could be reformed or bolstered uh, is absolutely ridiculous but what you have alongside that is you know life goes on and trade happens and parallel systems are created you know, one of the best, most effective, efficient and cheapest mobile phone systems in the world is Somalia. And that wasn't created by any central government. That was created by local entrepreneurs, realizing that without communications, you couldn't trade. And the imperative took over. And these little microcosms, these pockets of innovation crop up all across Africa. And I think what you quite rightly say at the moment with the chance to focus and look at this by effective investment, by looking, in an, and looking at the building blocks that you need in today's world, not yesterday's world which are basically um, communications and transport. So as long as you've got logistics and a, an ability to have a conversation, you can do business because money doesn't need banks anymore. Money transfer doesn't need banks anymore. The ab ability to source capital can be global. One of the biggest challenges to traditional aid agencies, I think, is not each other. I don't think Oxfam com uh, com is competing with Save the Children for the same donor. I think what's happening nowadays is that local organizations with a PayPal account and, a, and uh, an iPad are the ones that will take care because they will be the ones that will be able to communicate effectively what is happening on the ground in some of these remote areas because the communications infrastructure does exist. And all of that to say that I think if we can now look at the opportunities that exist through this entrepreneurial spirit that it exists in, in Africa and invest in it at the same time as providing the sticking plaster. The sticking plaster is needed with COVID and with this food insecurity, unless we just give people that safety net for a short period, 
it could fall into a hole. But if alongside that, business plays its role, and especially entrepreneurs, investors, and financiers play their role, and start in, in, investing effectively in the entrepreneurial spirit of Africa. If those two can happen in parallel, then I think we, we, we stand a reasonable chance of going back to that 3.9% growth uh, perspective and not the 54 drop in, in, um, in the overall GDP of Africa. Um, and I think there's a, there's a huge opportunity to do it. But people just have to change their mindset. They need to change how they think about investment and they need to think about the social purpose and the impact that underpins it. Uh, and this is, this is where the new frontier is. And you know, they say more millionaires are made in a recession than are made in a boom time. And this is where I think there's a huge opportunity that could also save a hell of a lot of lives if people grasp it. So when do you think the shift will come? Because at the moment, um, there's much needed support for our NHS and our frontline healthcare workers here in the UK. And there are fantastic initiatives um, being driven to support the healthcare workers where, in a lot of senses, the government has failed. You know, we, we have failed our healthcare workers with the PPE uh, and preparedness. But in other respects, the British government's been great. But more so than that, the British people have been fantastic. And the way that they've responded uh, to support people that they just don't know at home. But at some point, uh, the death rates will drop off, the infection rates will drop off. And then we're faced with a massive risk, again, of reinfection because we didn't protect countries such as Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Angola. And because of that, we're going to put our own healthcare workers back at major risk of a pandemic. So how do we balance the line of getting the British public to continue to do this amazing support which is required for these superstars, these heroes in the NHS? We've also thinking maybe I need to support some other not at home causes to make sure home stays safe as well yeah. and, and benefit both. How do we how do we split that? And I'm not necessarily talking about diverting funds and saying don't be donating to your local healthcare charity, donate to a African healthcare charity. But how do we make sure the funds are going in the right place? Because I suspect that some of the NHS hospitals have got so many free meals from Deliveroo now, the food's going to waste. When you and I know there's people in Africa starving. So how do we make sure that we get those balances of the right amount of free meals for the NHS workers, but what's left over? Okay, it maybe goes to the food banks. Okay, the food banks are well stocked. How do we then get that food back to the Africa or make sure the money's not spent on wasted food here and the money is spent in Bangladesh or, or Vietnam and countries where food insecurity is, is a major issue and could potentially restart the fire of the pandemic back in the UK. And, and yeah. So we're not playing catch up all the time yeah. because it, it feels like a sensitive subject to say, hey, wait a minute, send less food to X and start sending it to Y. I don't want to say who deserves food and who doesn't, but I'm yeah. sure there's going to start to become a wastage in the system where we could redeploy that better. I, I think you, this is where I, I'm a big believer that the appropriate, if, if you play the economics well, the, the other than the short term sticking plaster, and there, there is, you know, if we bolster a little bit the, the humanitarian assistance at the moment and channel some of the wasted development money into that, I think that there's probably enough there just for a short term fix. Uh, there's probably going to be need, need additional funding for WHO, but there's enough money in the system if the will is there to finance that. I actually think that the strongest message to people is don't necessarily send money overseas, but consume uh, and buy your essentials that represent the purpose that you wish to uh, that you wish to show you know buy goods look for fair trade look for the types of marks or the type of uh, of initiatives that unilever and others are doing it because big multinationals the, the biggest shift i think we will see for covid and in the future is when the biggest companies start taking sustainability and social purpose seriously when they actually walk the walk and do what they're talking about because these are companies that you know they're selling soap in the UK, but they're also selling exactly the same soap in Bangladesh and in India and in um, in Kenya and in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Globalization is such now that you can buy a flat screen television, a can of Coca-Cola and a pack in a Marlboro anywhere in the world. I could fly you to the middle of the Congo, you could still get it. The, 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 the systems are there. What we need is the people responsible for all the chains 
in these systems and the majority of them are controlled by major companies to actually take social purpose seriously because asking you're quite right asking somebody now when you know the, the road i live on there is a vulnerable old lady over the road and there's a single mother down the road i live in a nice area but they're, they're everywhere and asking somebody to send money overseas when that exists on your front doorstep is a big ask. But asking somebody to buy the cheese they need and the milk that they need and the washing powder that they need and look out for the type of purpose that actually demonstrates that they're doing something in the countries we've been talking about is the best way I think people can contribute. Because I think we're coming to the end of the idea that you live your business life over here you're successful and then you give a bit of money to charity over here and we're moving in into into an era where if your brand does not represent purpose if you are not demonstrating to the world that you're making a difference as well as making money you will go out of business and this was this i would love to say that it was me uh, saying that that was actually the governor of the bank of england that said that anybody who's not taking social pur purpose seriously will probably be out of business in about 10 years uh, and i couldn't agree with it more so for me don't well there are many worthy charities, give if you can, but if you actually want to change the world operates, start consuming with purpose, start taking investment with purpose seriously, start looking at the ESG criteria of the funds that you're investing in if you're in that, that line of work, and actually start looking at the end result of that impact. Because you're quite rightly, we live in a globalized world, and an imp, uh, 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 if Africa falls, we all fall. If Asia falls, we all fall. And uh, at the moment, we are at that teetering point where it could be a massive success story if we take sustainability and social purpose seriously, or if we just retreat in on ourselves and only focus on our own livelihoods. We might be okay for a short period, but if the rest of the planet is on fire, then, then ultimately we're all going to get it. And just to finish on that, I, I actually think also that this is a dress rehearsal. What's happening with COVID now is a dress re rehearsal for some of even the moderate estimates as what's going to be happening with climate change within the lifetime of our children. And unless we start getting used to the agility that's needed and the ability to pivot business models and the ability to adjust and actually do the right thing as well as just the profitable thing, this will not be the last time, even in our lifetime, that we see this type of uh, event happen. No, it won't. And I, I very much echo your comments there, particularly the ones where this problem isn't at home. And if we just focus on home, it's, it's never going to go away. Okay. Um, getting people to appreciate and understand that. So we've had a few questions come in from Adoria members uh, that I thought we should go through, which, um, Great. first of all, one member is asking, and it's a question I'm asking all the time. Why isn't the media reporting anything about how refugee camps are affected during this pandemic? I think, uh, unfortunately, we are in a vicious circle with the media. The media reports what it thinks people want to hear. But unfortunately, we can't be, people have been educated by the media into what they want to hear, and it becomes a vicious cycle. I think at the moment we're going through a very introspective cycle. I think people are very worried about being perceived as... as not looking after number one, not looking, not putting the UK first, America first, however you want to say it. And the media is responding to that and driving it. it it's almost the same phenomenon we're seeing with the internet, um, where if you consume it in a certain way, that's the only advertising you see, so you can continue to do so. Your perspectives are not broadened. And I think one of the challenges we have with the media at the moment is re-educating them back into maybe a sort of 1950s mindset of the BBC, where it is about broadening perspectives and broadening horizons rather than just telling people what it is they want to hear. Because for the most part, and I'm including me on that, I don't know what I want to hear. I just want to know what's going on and then I'll choose. Uh, and I think we've lost a little bit of that, that culture. So uh, I also think consuming uh, and buying the type of, of journals and, and news uh, products that do report fairly and, and decently like the BBC you know read the economist read magazines like this just don't buy the we all know what we're talking about the trashy ones that reinforce that however much fun they might be because that's just reinforcing the the, the sort of insularism that we have in the media at the moment and one of the other questions that's come in sticking with the theme of refugee camps is and I've got some thoughts on this myself, but question is, do you think there'll be a time when there won't be any refugee camps? Um, and before you answer that one, uh, Mike, uh, 
I think I've just recently been in a refugee camp called Kakuma, which is in northwestern Kenya. Um, it's got a community of about 250,000 people, operated by the UNHCR. And I'm actually wearing the Kakuma FC football top here, representing. Um, and Kakuma FC, for those of you that are interested, is a football team in a refugee camp which has managed to get into the National League, if that's good. And it's made up of refugees from South Sudan, Somalia, Somaliland, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Rwanda, Burundi, um, the U Uganda, the DRC. And what I've realised in that refugee camp, it's actually become a community. It's become integrated with the host community. And although it is there to host refugees, it, the UNHCR have done a fantastic job of developing it in a way where people still have dignity. People still have uh, what they can call a home. It's not rows of plastic tents. This is not, um, these are not refugee camps which are set up for, you know, torrential floods that have just come in and displaced people. These are camps which allow people to build businesses, to, to learn, to be educated, and hopefully one day be resettled or go back to their homes when, when drought has passed or uh, violence and threat of war has passed. So from my perspective, I think refugee camps are becoming more than refugee camps. They're, they're, they're becoming people's homes, their communities and a new place, a new way of life. But I guess the question here is, is there always going to be that need for providing facilities for refugees? And in some respects, we're all nomads, we're all travellers, we're all turning up in someone else's country or home or city to, to maybe be, uh, learn, to be educated, to, to, to invest, to be invested in for a job, to experience. And it's just the circumstances that send us there are, are very much different. Um, but these are just some personal views, Mike, and you know, I've not run these agencies, I've not worked in these camps, I've volunteered and I've lived and supported and tried to learn as much so that I can educate those that haven't been to understand the, the, the life of a refugee and that they're just as human as you and I. But yeah. I'd be interested to hear, where do you think the refugee camps are going and, uh, and will they be here? Will there be a time when we don't need them? I think that, that there will always be a need for temporary shelter um, because, as, as you've said, it can be because of natural disaster. It can be because of things outside of human control. Uh, you know, unless we find an end to war, there will always be displacement. Um, I, I think it's easier also because there's a certain semantic balance here. To be a refugee, technically, and many of you know, might know this, you need to cross an international border. Uh, if you are displaced within your own country, you're an IDP, you're an internally displaced person. So the refugee, that's why there is uh, an agency in the UN called IOM, who looks after migration, and, and uh, quite often will do migration within countries, so displaced within countries. And there's the High Commissioner for Refugees. To fall into their uh, mandate, you need to cross an international border. But as you've quite rightly said, and a little test for, for Adoria members, if somebody has made a refugee today, how long do you think that they will be a refugee for? The answer is, is not, most people say when I ask that question, two years, three years, five years. The answer somewhere between 17 and 19 years is the average time somebody is displaced. If you're displaced today, you will be displaced for an average of 17 to 19 years. So all of a sudden it stops being this, this as you, you put it, this temporary thing. They start becoming towns and communities. Up until the, the, the Myanmar um, Rohingya conflict and the, the, the displacement into Myanmar, the biggest refugee camp in the world was Dadaab, which is on the Somali-Kenyan border. It's about 450,000 people, and we're seeing the third generation of person being born in those, those camps now. It's only called a refugee camp because the people have Somali nationality. In any other circumstance, it will be called a town. There are trade, there is sanitation systems, there is medical clinics, there is all of the, the, the infrastructure that you would expect to see in your average town. The only reason it's called a refugee camp is because somebody's crossed a border and they don't have the nationality of the place in. So we start getting to that, that age old argument that we've had in the UK that what, what's the difference between an immigrant and an expat? You know, an expat's white. Um, <laughs> anybody who's not is an immigrant. Um, uh, and it's exactly the same thing. Um, uh, and so, yes, there will always be displaced, 
whether or not we call them refugees is a matter for nationality and, 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 and acceptance in local communities. But uh, an awful lot of the refugee camps we deal with today have been here for 17 to 19 years, will continue to be there for a very long time. And we should actually just call them towns. And, and if we do that, then we start treating them with the planning and the economics and the access to what we were talking about earlier, the access to trade, the access to build factories, the access to actually create jobs and wealth in these environments. And that's the route out of being these being microcosms of poverty and into a, into a, a situation where they can be entrepreneurial and where they stop needing international assistance. No, it's very true, Mike. You know, a lot of, we all have to remember every town or city we live in started because people came together to trade, to meet. Some were invaders, some were, you know, um, internally displaced and set up shop. Some were the explorers. So towns start somewhere and it's by people coming together. Some through search of food, some through search of protection. Some just they want better weather, right? So we've, every town has started in some respects by internally displaced people, refugees, or those seeking a better life. Yeah, um, and it's a good point. We need to think of refugee camps much more of you know future cities, future towns. Yeah. Uh, well, so so many questions here to go through, Mike. But I'm going to wrap up on a final one which is asked by another Adore member who's saying, how can we make real change in the world and how do we make leaders take action? Um, now, I think we've touched on the change and we are all making a change and there are simple ways to make change and there are bigger and broader and tougher ways that change needs to be made where leaders, and I think that stems from business leaders who also leaders of government need to step up and take it forwards. How how do we get those leaders to, to step forwards and think about what is actually going on on the ground? I, th I think, um, and again, a little bit cynical, but, uh, but having been in this, this industry for a very long time, I found unless you gear the incentives correctly, people pay things lip service. So I think, you know, if you go to governments or business leaders with a begging bowl, you will get the scraps off the side of the table. If you go to them with an opportunity, uh, an, an opportunity to to invest correctly where they can make money and where wealth can be created and then i think the things will actually change to give you an example i launched a, a nutrition fund as part of the launch of the sdgs with the president of mali and the president of france at the time at the un general assembly um, and this was when i was leading the big french nutrition ngo um, and we launched it together and we found that all the arguments about the number of children that might starve to death fell flat but the argument that one of the best investments you will ever make is in the nutrition of your young people, because young people who are not well nourished don't learn properly. And we, we came out with some, some empirical evidence that showed that an investment in, in nutrition would see a bump in GDP of 13% within 10 years. And every finance minister's radar went up. And this is just me going back to the point I made before. If, if you say to people, give me charity, you will get a bid. If you say to people, consume, get what you want, buy what you need, invest where, where, where it will make you money, because it will make you money in, in a lot of these places, but do it with a sense of social purpose. Do it with a question of where, where are the funds I'm investing in actually ending up? Is the product I'm buying, does it represent fair trade? It does, is the farmer being paid a fair wage? Is the producer being treated ethically? If you consume in this way, trickle-down economics will start working. Because I think we, we all know at the moment that theoretically trickle-down economics is a good idea. Unfortunately, the system's broken at the moment. So the money doesn't trickle down to where it's needed to be, where, where it's needed. If we fix that, then we fix this in the longer term. If we continue to rely on charity, we will continue to be chronically underfunded, have massive levels of inequality, and ultimately end up in the situation that we're in today. Because an awful lot of the situation we're in today, COVID or not, in terms of the problems going on in the world, are due to inequality. They're not due to very specific contexts. It's global inequality at the moment. Uh, well, I think really good answer, Mike. And the bottleneck in all of that is businesses playing their part and, and, and sharing wealth far better than they are currently. 
And if I can just give an incentive to everybody, there was a good bit of work done last year that showed that 79% of consumers under the age of 40 in the UK and over 82% in the US either look for social purpose in the brands they buy or um, uh, uh, it's an app point of sale tipping point decision. And for those of you in the finance sector, D Diffid just did a bit of work with a large consulting firm, one of the big four, that showed that 69% of UK investors and, and majority through pensions look at where their funds are being invested and are starting to take notice of the ESG ratings and the ethical ratings of the, pe the, the funds that they're investing in. So this is something consumers want. And going back to what I said before, Mark Carney's warning, Bill Gates is warning, everybody's warning. Unless you underpin what you do with a sense of purpose as you do, Dominic, you will probably be out of business in 10 years. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Mike. Well, I think it's been a fantastic conversation. I very much hope um, all of you watching at home, of your offices are, are safe and well and enjoying uh, what we've been talking about and hopefully enlightening you on some of the issues that's happening in the developing world, in refugee camps. Uh, which may not be getting reported on on a daily basis on the regular news channels and feeds that you have. But things aren't going to get better for some time. And the only way that they're going to get better for everyone is to make sure everyone gets a fair deal out of this, gets the right support, not just us here in the developed communities and countries of the world. This virus will not end until every link in the chain is secure. And that means every single person on this planet. And I think, Mike, you've, you've really helped explain that to a lot of people today and hopefully opened some eyes and got some ears pricked into thinking about where they spend, how they spend, and being conscious of making sure they spend with sustainable and ethical brands because that will translate down to the farmers, the, the garment workers, the factory workers in some of the poorest parts of the world. Um, I hope we can do this again soon, Mike, and I'm look for, looking forward to seeing you person to person again as opposed to through our computers sure. which don't give me the best of glow uh, it's been an absolute pleasure as always and i look forward to catching up again very soon as well